We have uh, the, the current COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted virtually every sporting event worldwide. And many events, including music, theater, conferences, and exhibitions have been canceled or postponed in the wake of COVID-19, and more will follow. The Olympics have been postponed until 2021. World Championships and World Cups for virtually every sport have been canceled or postponed, and the calendars for most major sports have been severely disrupted with no clear indication yet of how or when this will be resolved. Now, the cancellation of postponement of events will have an obvious and material economic impact, particularly for those businesses whose principal source of income derives from the successful running of these events. Now, what is the knock-on effect caused by postponed events and uh, the rescheduling of these uh, ev events? Uh, well, um, obviously, you expect colossal financial losses mm -hmm. on the part of the event organizers. I was quite thrilled. I think it was about a fortnight ago mm -hmm. when we got the heartwarming news that the event organizers for Wimbledon cashed out about $148 billion insurance mm. uh, from their insurers. So uh, that, that is heartwarming, like I said, because it simply means that there's actually a solution if only people will be pragmatic enough in their business relationships mm. to ensure that the, the these risks are foreseen ahead of time and, yeah. and you try as much as possible to mitigate the after effects. Now, uh, insurance is something that unfortunately we are adverse to in this part of the world. But mm. the important thing is that at one point in time in your business, you need insurance cover. Sure. So that insurance coverage, uh, you have two broad uh, categorization. One is indemnity. And one of the essential um, parts or types of indemnity insurance is what we call business interruption insurance mm. or event cancellation insurance. Event cancellation, like we've had, we've had the um, Wimbledon, like I said, cancelled. We've had just the, uh, just two days ago, just yesterday, uh, we had um, the Doctor DVC season yeah, cancelled, cancelled as well. So when you look at it. The Tokyo 2020 Olympics Tokyo 2020. as well. Oh, well. That one has been rescheduled oh. to 2021. Well, they will still have to pay some, some they money. They will. They yeah. will pay money. So uh, the question is, is there proper insurance cover for these events? Oh. There are no proper insurance cover. And that's why you um, understand the reluctance of the uh, Japanese government at first oh. to postpone the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Because everybody was hoping that um, with the onset of summer, mm. the whole uh, thing coast will be clear as to where we are on the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Unfortunately, the figures kept spiking up. So it, it became very, very impossible for anyone to do anything about it. So the only decision to be taken at that point was to completely uh, reschedule the events. Sure. So now, event uh, cancellation or rescheduling uh, insurance is a type of indemnity insurance taken by event organizers to mitigate against risks uh, revolving around cancellation, curtailment, uh, rescheduling, or, or even uh, outright postponement of events, such as you know, these sporting and entertainment events. Mm. So uh, now the, the interesting point is that this type of insurance, you know, it trumps up a lot of uh, legal issues. And one of the obligations imposed on a policyholder a policyholder is the person who takes out an insurance cover. Mm. So one of the obligations is uh, the duty of um, utmost uh, good faith. It simply means that you must materially disclose every fact surrounding the transaction. Yeah. Where you conceal any facts which uh, would have uh, affected the decision of the insurer in entering into the policy with you in the first place, once you, once you withhold such material facts, it would affect your recovery in the event of the occurrence of the risk protected against. So now, uh, there's an interesting American case, uh, the case of HDMG Entertainment and um, uh, underwriters of Lloyd's Assurance. Right. To hold you yes. there, I think we have a caller uh, on the line uh, to join the conversation this morning. Good morning to you, caller. Are you there? All right, uh, I think the network is having a bit of issues, but you, you would um, um, continue. Yes, so that's, that case revolved around um, 
an insurance policy taken by uh, the policyholder. The policyholder had taken out an insurance policy trying to hedge the risk of cancellation mm. of an entertainment event. Mm. It, it, All right, okay. Juliana is on the line um, again. Good morning, Juliana. Good morning, Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. All right, um, let's have your say on what we've talked about so far. Okay, so I have a question. Okay. I want to ask the effects of the FIFA guideline on Nigerian football. All right, Steve, the effect of the Nigeria, um, FIFA guideline on Nigerian football. Okay, the effect is very straightforward. Um, unfortunately, we have very weak regulation here. Mm. Uh, it's easy to make such guidelines for clubs where you have, um, you have a determinate start, start off of the season and a mm. determinate end. So in other words, when you don't have a concrete regulation, guiding your football it becomes very very difficult to apply it now the effect is very very simple fifa had in that guideline stated that the national law of the country affected would apply in the event of a dispute so what it simply means is that where you have employment disagreements or employment wrangles mm. between a club and the player mm. obviously maybe due to non-payment of salary or wage cuts the National Industrial Court will have jurisdiction to determine uh, such disputes. That is one. And the second point is, you look at our laws, you know, the position at common law was that the relationship between an employer and an employee is that of master-servant. Mm -hmm. So the master was at liberty to hire and fire. That has changed with the enactment of the National Industrial Courts Act, okay. 2006, and the um, Third Alteration Act to the Constitution that came up in 2010. So what has happened now is that in applying labor principles, the court takes cognizance of uh, international best practices. So in other words, that's why most times they accuse the National Industrial Court of being pro-employee. So because you to do everything possible to protect the employee. So certain acts now have been termed um, uh, unfair labor practices, mm. which would um, give some kind of protection to the players and any employee for that matter. So the player comes within the definition of, a, of, a, of an employee. Yeah. So it will, it will be protected. So but I don't know how much of the uh, such disputes gets to the National Industrial Court mm. because most of them don't want to be seen to be fighting the fighting the clubs. So to answer Juliana's question, the, the effect is no, go on. the effect is that the, the uh, Nigerian Premier League will now be at liberty to extend contracts in case of players whose contracts will be terminating on June 30th. The clubs can now unilaterally extend those contracts until whenever the season ends. Yeah. So, and that is why, I, like I said before, you raise these questions about uh, party autonomy in contracting and yeah. uh, unilateral extension of contracts, oh. which even FIFA jurisprudence frowns upon. Yeah. So, um, in a nutshell, that guideline would affect Nigerian football.